This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, can you teach someone to have perfect pitch? So absolutely no reference on being able to name musical notes seemingly out of thin air. All that and more when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. One side will say, listen, people make a decision to come here illegally. What expectations should people have? What rights do they have? The 12 million undocumented immigrants who call the U.S. home. Then, when he said that on national television, but my hair was on fire because that's not an element that the government has to prove. The disparities when it comes to prosecuting white collar crime. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. If you're a musician, it's always helpful to hit the right notes. But some people are a lot better than others at finding the right notes. People like Mozart, Beethoven, and John Philip Sousa, who could hear any sound and tell you exactly what note it is. Dr. Diana Deutsch, professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego, says it's called perfect pitch. It's generally used to refer to the ability to identify a note by its name in the absence of a reference note. So if you hear a particular note, you can say that's C sharp or that's G and so on. So what that means is you would be walking down the street, you'd hear a car alarm and you'd be able to say, ah, that's in G or G sharp or something like this. So absolutely no reference on being able to name musical notes seemingly out of thin air. That's Stephen Van Hedger, a postdoctoral fellow at the Brain and Mind Institute at the University of Western Ontario. He not only researches perfect pitch, he has perfect pitch, which some experts call absolute pitch. And he says many people who have it can not only name any note they hear, they can produce any note on demand. In many cases, it should work in terms of both perception and production, but production can be measured in a couple of different ways. If I asked you to give me a C-sharp, could you give me a C-sharp? Sure. Oh. So is that really a C-sharp? Yep. But how do they know that? Dr. Howard Nussbaum, professor of psychology at the University of Chicago, says people with perfect or absolute pitch don't even have to think about it. For people who don't have absolute pitch, to get a sense of something that is like absolute pitch, as you're listening to me talk and I say a word like dog, you just hear the word. The word just merges in your head from the sounds coming out of my mouth, and you know that word has the consonants D, the vowel A, and the consonant G in it. So I say dog and you hear it as a word, as if you were seeing it in print. Absolute pitch is kind of like that. The note is heard as the note. So it's not that you hear something like a sound in the distance and you go, oh, what is that sound? I think that sound might be a gunshot. It's something that comes to you as the note itself. So I started piano around seven or eight years old but never had the kind of insight that I was different in any way. In fact, I found it very surprising that other members of my family couldn't do this ability, be turned around and name notes that were being played on the piano. A C had a certain C-ness about it, a G had a certain G-ness about it, right? That just seemed self-evident. So it was very surprising to figure out that not everybody could do this. So how many people can do that? Deutsch says it's a matter of debate. The number that's generally given is one in 10,000. And that was initially sort of pulled out of the air. But I think that it's actually reasonable. In my experience with testing an awful lot of people, I'm constantly surprised at how very rare perfect pitch is. We quote in our papers the number that everyone expresses, which is one in 10,000. But Steve has been able to find lots of people with absolute pitch. And these are people who actually pass all the tests, the estimate that's out there in the public of 1 in 10,000 is really low. Deutsch believes that most of us are born with the capacity of developing perfect pitch if we're given the right environment early enough. Studies have shown that babies will use 
the sort of absolute pitch level of tones rather than relative pitch levels in making various judgments that have been designed for babies to be able to make. On the other hand, that's different from being able to label a note, to name one. And of course, babies can't speak, so they can't do that anyway. I think that most people have a form of implicit absolute pitch. That is that they can get a pretty good idea of what key a piece is in or whether or not when they hear it, if it's being played in the correct key, but they're unable to actually name the note. But isn't that simply a matter of not having musical training? Could there be millions of people who have perfect pitch and don't know it? So that's one of the classic kind of catch-22s of actually measuring absolute pitch ability. So many of the traditional ways in which we would test for absolute pitch necessitate a kind of musical knowledge, right? Because they're being tested and asked to give an explicit musical label. But I think you're, you're hitting on an important point, which is... An individual could process pitches in an absolute sense, but having absolutely no musical training would not have the kind of a cultural label to ascribe to any particular isolated pitch. And so that has been proposed as one reason why absolute pitch estimates might be actually artificially low. And it could be there's a little perfect pitch in all of us. That earworm, the tune that's stuck in your head and won't leave, that's auditory working memory, the same place that perfect pitch comes from there's actually a growing body of research that suggests regardless of whether or not you have perfect pitch or regardless of whether or not you're a musician versus, you know, a musical novice, that most individuals have some kind of absolute pitch representation for the right kind of stimuli. So you mentioned songs getting stuck in your head, for instance. So there's good evidence to suggest that if I play you a song that you're very familiar with, and I play you two versions, one that is at the exact absolute pitch that you would hear in your environment, and one that's ever so subtly shifted by, let's say, one note, one semitone, that you might not be perfect at being able to tell the correct one, but you would be significantly above chance at saying, yes, this is the correct version that I hear in my environment. So even though you wouldn't necessarily be able to say, oh, well, this one's in C and this one's in C sharp, and I know that the song I hear in my environment is C, so therefore that's the correct answer, you still have a kind of an implicit knowledge of this one sounds more correct than this other one. Deutsch says that absolute pitch is much more common where tonal languages such as Vietnamese and Mandarin are spoken. Toddlers learn to match pitches because the same syllables spoken at different pitches means different things. For example, the word ma means mother and ma means hemp and ma means horse and ma is a reproach. In Mandarin. In the Western world, Deutsch says musical training is more likely to produce perfect pitch, but the traditional belief is that it has to come at an early age or the window closes. People who began musical training at age five do a little bit better, you know, statistically as a group, than people who began musical training at age, say, six, who do a little bit better than people who began training at age seven. And then by age eight, it's really unlikely that a person would score well on a test for perfect pitch. So it has been generally assumed that whatever kind of absolute pitch knowledge you may have is either completely genetically predetermined or cultivated in a critical period, so a very early period of of musical instruction. And then by adulthood, that ability is essentially crystallized. There's not much wiggle room in terms of your absolute pitch ability. In other words, traditional thinking is that if you haven't acquired perfect pitch by about age 10, you'll never get it. But Hedger and Nussbaum, along with University of Chicago researcher Dr. Shannon Heald, are producing studies challenging that assumption. In one of them, the team recruited a group of adults without regard to musical training and pre-tested them to be sure they didn't have perfect pitch. After we pre-tested them, we gave them a little bit of feedback. That was a C, that was a G, that was an F sharp, things like this. So we did this for approximately, um, the training lasted around 40 minutes. And then afterwards, we would test them without feedback on the same piano notes that they were trained on. And so what we found is... um, a significant improvement over the course of training. I think it's important to note, likely due to the short nature of training here, 
that we weren't suddenly seeing, you know, everybody have perfect pitch. We saw significant learning. Participants even did well with notes they hadn't been trained on in different octaves and played by different musical instruments. But even that improvement wouldn't mean much if the participants forgot everything they'd learned as soon as they walked out of the lab. Hedger says that didn't happen. They had done a single session of learning and then went out into the world, came back several months later and seemed to retain a lot more of this absolute pitch knowledge than I think anybody would actually believe. So we actually did not see any significant decreases in performance for this generalized learning test, which I think is probably the most stringent test of absolute pitchability. So a very slight decrease, but not statistically significant. So whatever kind of knowledge that they actually learned in the initial learning session seemed to be relatively stable even many months after training had ended. But if people can improve a lot with less than an hour of training, is it possible that a little more work can actually teach perfect pitch? Hedger says that ongoing studies indicate yes. There is good evidence that at least for some adults who would not pass any tests for absolute pitch, after eight weeks, which is approximately 40 hours of training, they are behaviorally indistinguishable from absolute pitch possessors. So we see this in a subset of participants. And so an interesting question is, would we see this in all participants given more training? Or does this have to do with potentially a kind of a genetic predisposition that is being shaped with the right kind of environmental experience. So it's much too early to tell, but expanding this kind of training paradigm to a much longer term setting does seem to successfully train what you would call genuine absolute pitchability, at least in some adults. But what's perhaps more important to all of us, and not just musicians, is that these studies may apply to a lot more than just perfect pitch. They may apply to how we learn almost everything. These new studies are challenging old assumptions that some things are simply unlearnable. People have argued that this is something you have to be born with, that you need early experience with, that there's a critical period for, and they make those claims about a number of things. And so one of the issues that we are interested in generally is to try to understand are the limits that people have made assumptions about. There's no evidence for that. Those are really assumptions people make. Are we that limited as humans? And the work on perfect pitch is actually a testing ground. It's a way of trying to understand that general problem and to challenge some of those notions. And so we look at this not just as trying to understand perfect pitch, and what we've acquired from our environment, what exposure does, and what are the toolkits we need in order to promote that learning, but also in terms of a more general problem of how do we learn spoken language? How do we learn to perceive things in the world like regularities and structure? So it may be that the limits of learning we've always accepted aren't really limits at all. It may not matter that you can't tell a C sharp from an A flat, but it may mean you're never too old to learn. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org, where you'll also find archives of our programs. You can also find our programs wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Reed Pence. As many as 89% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients are at risk of a complication called cytokine storm, a leading cause of COVID death. But there's good news. Hospitals across the U.S. are enrolling patients in a trial evaluating lenzilumab, a treatment candidate designed specifically to stop this storm, even with only one day of treatment. Dr. Cameron Durant, CEO of Humanogen, the company developing lenzilumab. Having a therapeutic that can significantly reduce the time to recovery from COVID-19 and send patients home earlier could dramatically impact the arc of this pandemic. Participating in the study means access to a potential treatment option in addition to standard of care therapies. Trial participant Mark Baranski shares his experience. I don't know if I received lenzilumab or not, but I viewed the trial as doing everything I could for my recovery while contributing to the fight against COVID-19. I certainly encourage others to do the same. To learn more and find this trial near you, visit StopStorm.com. That's StopStorm.com. The American College of Physicians is celebrating National Internal Medicine Day on Wednesday, October 28th, and is proud to represent internal medicine specialists and subspecialists who make a difference in the lives of their patients every day. Internists are specialists in the diagnosis, treatment, and compassionate care of adults across the spectrum, from health to complex illness. ACP President and Internist Dr. Jacqueline Fincher. 
General internists are trained to diagnose complex medical problems such as hypertension or diabetes and manage acute illnesses. Some internists subspecialize in a related area such as cardiology. And in this time of COVID-19, internists are often on the front lines of public health emergencies to provide information, guidance, and care to help people stay well and out of the hospital. Internists are researchers, teachers, and administrators. They're even sometimes called the doctor's doctor, as they're often called upon to consult to other physicians and help solve puzzling issues. Find out more at acponline.org. Multiple sclerosis affects an estimated 1 million adults in the U.S. alone. In multiple sclerosis, the immune system mistakenly attacks the central nervous system, affecting a person's muscle control, balance, vision, sensation, and cognitive function. Though the exact causes are unknown, Epstein-Barr virus, a very common virus which causes mononucleosis, is the only risk factor identified to date that appears to be necessary for the development of MS. An investigational therapy called called ATA-188, specifically recognizes Epstein-Barr virus-infected B cells. It is currently being studied in a clinical trial, which is now seeking participants. If you or someone you know is living with progressive MS and is interested in participating in the ATA-188 clinical trial, please email patientadvocacy at atarabio.com to learn more and find a trial site in your area. That's patientadvocacy at ATA. A-R-A-B-I-O dot com. A message from Greenstone, a Pfizer company. Most of us know about generic medications, drugs that work in the same way and provide the same clinical benefit as brand name medications, often at a lower price. Most generics are made by a different manufacturer than the original brand, but there is also a lesser known category of generic medications called authorized generics that are made by the same manufacturer of the brand name drug. Authorized generics, like all generics, meet FDA quality and manufacturing standards. Authorized generics are the same as the brand name drug and only differ in that they do not have the brand name on their labels and may have a different marking on the medication. In limited cases, they may have a different color. Authorized generics are not new. Greenstone has been supplying authorized generics for over 25 years. Talk to your pharmacist or visit GreenstoneGenerics.com to learn more and see if they manufacture an authorized generic version of the medication you take. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Radio Health Journal is a production of MediaTrax Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. Conservation, biodiversity loss, and climate change can really no longer be separated from the field of public health and thinking about the health and well-being of all the people on the planet. A new field of science, planetary health. Then the many kinds of grief and why we can't put it on the back burner. Not dealing with grief brings its own set of complications. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.